That's quite an introduction. I've never been called a wandering mercenary before. <laughs> um, but um, so thank you very much for your time and, and, and coming here today. And thank you very much to um, uh, everybody who's worked on, on uh, setting this event up and introducing me so kindly. What I thought I could do, um, there's an enormous amount going on here. I mean, you've got already, we've already talked about um, the forthcoming uh, vote, uh, which is going to be of critical importance. That's actually, uh, what, you know, it's a topic of great relevance for clean energy investment. Um, but there's also, what I thought I could try to do is talk about the industry, or the clean energy industry, but try to locate it in some of those uh, issues that are very current at the moment. And also, on the invitation uh, letter that I received, and also as you walk in the door here, this is the Institute of uh, International and European Affairs. So I thought uh, I could try and at least um, finish with a few remarks on some of the global activities, global initiatives in this space, which are um, you know, um, of, of potentially dramatic importance uh, and potentially not. So we can look at that. So I could start, I think, by, hang on a second, I think if I, let me see how this works. If I point, there we go. Um, Start by showing this because um, at the heart, one of the things that emerged even at the lunch is just we, we just talked about finance. We could have talked about lots of other things, but all of the at the heart of it, we kept coming back to this question of finance. Uh, Pat's already mentioned um, the trillion dollar, a trillion euros that's required. I think that's just the generating side. It's actually a couple of trillion by 2030 in European uh, energy infra uh, infrastructure alone, five trillion uh, globally. You know, the, the, and, and finance and the flow of capital is, of course, at the heart of that, and that's what we look at all the time. So this chart here, you can see the amount of money that's flowed into... <coughs> It's a definition of clean energy that we use. Uh, there are others. It, it includes renewable energy, smart grid, uh, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage. It doesn't include gas or nuclear, not because we don't like them, but because we just, you know, to, to get a clean signal on the new energy technologies, that's what we're showing here. And you can see that the numbers have grown from about 50 billion back in 2004 up to 260 billion. So approximately a 5x increase in that uh, eight year period. Uh, and that's, um, you know, that, that is, uh, you, know, the, you can see all the trends there, you can see the glory years when it just went up, and you can see the crisis and so on. And what, let, let's use that data and sort of drill in and see a little bit at some of the drivers behind that. Um, there you see it on a regional basis, um, and you can see that Europe up here was a sort of early leader. And then you can see the US was probably next off the blocks, and then the impact of the recession of the crisis, very dramatic in uh, the US as Lehman failed. Uh, but then it recovered with stimulus funds uh, from the administration. Uh, Asia, it's a question of what, you know, what crisis. It's just been an extraordinary growth story, uh, not just driven by China, but China was clearly uh, the major player here. So China is now doing about 50 billion. Of that 260 billion, China is doing about 50 billion, so around uh, a fifth of all of the investment in clean energy. Um, last year, the US actually pipped China, um, got back into top position, uh, but that was a lot to do with some of the stimulus program expiring, the grant programs, loan guarantees, and so on, that were short-term programs, and so there was a rush for the line to get projects financed and construction started uh, before that funding expired. And we'll come that back to some of these other, here you see down in Latin America, you can see a lot of ethanol investment around the sort of 2006 time frame, and that's fallen away a little bit. Uh, but there is a level of activity, and you see Brazil, and you see Chile doing some wind. Uh, and then here you see Africa. And we'll come back to this question of um, what happens outside OECD and BRICS uh, when we talk about that global uh, process. So if you add up the total amount of investment in clean energy, uh, we announced at the end of last year that we had tracked the first trillion dollars of investment in this space. Uh, and actually, Pat, you got us started by using the trillion word. Um, and that's also something very, very important to realize. Clearly not here uh, in your domestic system. You don't need trillions, you know, billions or ten, actually tens of billions would, would probably do. Um, but globally, we're talking about trillion dollar demand. So as you look at any policy debate, as you look at initiatives, um, if there's stimulus funds that are going to be released uh, uh, after the, the, the vote or uh, in response to that or not, the question is, is it of a scale that is commensurate with the level of investment that's required? Because in this space, you know, billions are not cool, trillions are cool. But we have seen the first uh, trillion that has flowed in, in clean energy. 
And so if you compare uh, clean energy versus fossil fuels, this is just generating capacity now. You can see that um, clean energy uh, has grown and actually it's, it's something like 40, 60 now investment worldwide, uh, clean energy versus fossil. Um, I think nuclear just doesn't appear on this chart. We, we probably should put a third line. But the, it's an important chart to show because I think a lot of people's view of wind and solar and geothermal and biomass and so on is that it's still alternative and, and very minor and very uh, and it's, it's not the main event. Actually, what you see is globally, it's already reached something like 40% of generating capacity investment. And if you look at Europe, it's already well over 40%. Um, so it's already uh, into the 70% plus uh, range. So that those outside the industry who think this stuff is marginal and we don't really need to worry about it, let's, uh, let, you know, let's fix some big things first. This is actually the big thing. Let's put it in context. Renewable energy, 16% of final energy production, 19.4% of electricity. A lot of that is large hydro, but the modern forms, wind, solar, etc., uh, are up into the sort of 3, 4 and pushing 5% globally. Um, by no means trivial. Germany, now this is interesting because one of the debates in the UK and one of the debates in the US is this stuff is all expensive, we shouldn't be doing it um, because it's going to, you know, we, we've got a fragile recovery, if a recovery at all, and clearly this shouldn't be a priority. Whereas here you have Europe's most dynamic uh, economy, Germany, 21% of its electricity last year was renewable. Um, so I think that the, the link between um, uh, shifting the mix of energy towards clean sources and economic uh, ruin has not, it, it's certainly not been established. Um, and then 50% of new power capa capacity additions in China are renewable. We've all heard the, the, the can out about China adding one new coal fired power station uh, every week. Um, the good news is it's not actually true. It was true back in 2005. It's not true anymore. It's now one coal-fired power station every two weeks, um, which always raises a smile, but it's better than one a week. It is actually half the rate of building uh, coal-fired power stations and uh, wind and other clean sources, now 50% of capacity additions uh, in China. So that's sort of good news, that there's money flowing and it's happening pretty much around the world, uh, the exception of, of uh, Middle East Africa, which we'll come back to. But this is the valuation of clean energy companies. It's an index we publish. It's 96 um, uh, constituents. Um, and you can see going back to January 2011, it has <coughs> underperformed the general stock market by a considerable margin. I think that's something like 60%, uh, 50 to 60% underperformance. And so you have this kind of cognitive dissonance between this industry growing rapidly uh, around the world, attracting finance, and yet... Uh, it's, it, it just is doing extremely badly from a valuation point of view. And obviously, the, you know, there's a number of factors. We can look at them. Uh, this is uh, probably the most significant, is just the instability. Europe is the core market for renewable energy. And renewable energy requires a lot of debt over a long time period. And investors are... Uh, extremely intolerant of risk. So the financial crisis has had an absolutely corrosive impact on investment uh, levels uh, in the sector. Now uh, you can see that here. This is the same chart of investment over time, but we're now we're doing it quarterly. The red line is, uh, is, is four quarters smoothed, just taking Europe. And it's all new finance, so it's venture capital and, uh, and private equity and public market listings and so on. So you can see here this was Iberdrola Renovables, uh, big IPO, the peak month, uh, peak quarter ever at the end of 2007. This is the impact of the crisis. What we've now got is no, react no recovery from the crisis. And in fact, in the last couple of quarters, investment going off a cliff so that we're now back in Q1 2012 to a level of investment that we've not seen since, I think, the end of 2005. And clearly, if you, I I irrespective of what's happening in any other uh, region, if Europe had powered ahead and continued to invest, even at the same level, if not at an increased level from 2007, then the industry would be in a very different place. That's a lot of the answer to the overcapacity uh, that there is in solar and in, in wind and so on, was an expectation of momentum, not an expectation that investment uh, levels would drop. <clears throat> in the US, uh, we're in this kind of weird year. Um, the US 
electoral cycles seem to, you know, they have one election every four years and campaigning seems to last four years, but um, Solyndra was a solar company that was heavily supported through the loan uh, guarantee program and went rather spectacularly bankrupt shortly after taking half a billion, um, half a billion dollars, or not half a trillion, but half a billion dollars, uh, and has become a political football. And the debate in the US is, is utterly toxic um, with, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the, the administration which has heavily supported clean energy through the stimulus program and then obviously creating, therefore, through investments like Solyndra, an easy target uh, for the uh, Republicans to attack. And, and I think that energy has become a political football in this election to an extent that you know, I, I don't have huge history of following US, but I, I, can't, I can't think of an election that I've followed where energy has been quite so much uh, at the heart of it uh, and quite so contentious and with quite such, so little bipartisan um, support uh, for, for, for initiatives which I think most, you know, mo well, uh, most people would regard as sensible. What's happening in the US is actually um, sort of, a, it's, a, it's an example of a broader trend. Uh, there are 96 countries around the world that have got policy support for clean energy. Um, some tremendous work done by an organization called REN21 to list all of these policies out. Um, 96 countries have got some sort of support uh, in place, whether it's feed-in tariffs or certificate systems or renewable portfolio standards or Dutch auctions for clean energy capacity. Um, but what we're seeing is um, policy weakening. So whether it's stimulus programs that are expiring or whether it's tariffs being reduced, um, there's uh, a, a tendency to reduce the policy support. Now, uh, I'm going to argue that that reduction is actually uh, the, the less than the cost reductions that we've seen in the industry. So in other words, the support is being dismantled, but it's not being dismantled um, so fast that the industry is becoming uneconomic. Um, but nevertheless, in terms of the valuation of stocks, in terms of the news flow, it feels like awful news. Uh, the tariffs being uh, reduced and removed in Germany, uh, the retroactive tariff uh, activity in Spain, obviously very bad news. In the UK, solar tariffs, you know, there's enormous debate. But as we'll see, um, the costs actually coming down faster than any of those policies are being removed. There we go. So that's the experience. So countervailing um, uh, drivers within the industry, as I say, the costs are coming down. And it's really quite extraordinary, particularly what's happened in solar. 75% drop uh, in, since 2008. 45% drop in the last year. That means that around the world, anybody who's looked at a solar project and decided not to do it because of the economics has to dust that dossier off and has to look at it again. Um, this may not be of enormous relevance here in, in Ireland. It's probably, I don't know whether you have less sun than the UK. I suspect, I suspect so. But you know, it's, not a, it's not a Northern Europe uh, thing. But you know, in any sunny country, uh, this has really transformed the economics of, of solar. You can look at what it does. Um, I mean, this is... I'm being fooled by the clicker, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, so here you've got uh, a little chart that looks at the competitiveness of solar without subsidies. And what you can see is these are broadly more sunny countries, so countries that where a solar panel can produce more output each year. And then up at the top is countries with high retail power prices, so Denmark, Germany, Italy, Spain, and so on. These are countries where there's a high price, because solar will become competitive first in places where there's lots of sun, and electricity prices are high. So now that's 2010. The only place where you would do unsubsidized solar was Hawaii. If you go to 2012, Denmark and Germany, not because they're very sunny, but because electricity prices are high, but Italy, Spain, and Australia, that's the beginning of an unsubsidized market for distributed solar. It has already happened. Anybody who says, oh, solar will be great when it's competitive, that actually uh, happened 2011 and certainly into 2012. And you know, you can run this thing forwards. You can run this thing forwards, there we go. And you can see what happens year on year. As the costs drop, you see more and more countries uh, where solar becomes competitive without 
uh, any subsidy. So then you get to the point where Mexico, Texas, uh, North India, big markets, Japan. Japan is now rolling out a feed-in tariff, but it'll be, uh, they have to have a feed-in tariff to get uh, investment to happen. But by 2025, no question, it should be happening without that. Um, and you see some other big markets that will still, even in 2025, not uh, make sense. But they tend to be less sunny and ones with very low, possibly subsidized uh, energy prices. When it comes to solar, you've got to start thinking about tipping points. This is um, installation of capacity in Europe. Again, probably not in Ireland, but it's driven by uh, Germany and Italy um, with a certain amount of Spain, particularly around 2008, and now France, uh, even Czech Republic, which they then regretted and so on. But what's extraordinary here is a technology that six, seven years ago was essentially absent from the power mix is now more than half of, of capacity additions in Europe. Not half of energy, because it's only used during the day and when it's sunny and so on, but half of capacity. And this has profound implications um, on the economics of solar, because it drives it down that experience curve, but also for the way that electricity markets function. The spot price of electricity on a sunny day in Europe, you can pretty much guarantee is going to be zero or negative, because there's so much of this stuff. Uh, and on a windy day, of course, you've got the issues of, of wind power being uh, dumped out and, and, or available at, at very low uh, marginal costs. So extremely um, significant. There's nothing marginal or on the fringe about this sort of um, development. Now, wind also has an experience curve. Solar experience curve is 15%, you 20%, 24%, know, different academics. We have our own figures, but it's a very rapid. It feels sort of like flat screen TVs or, or uh, computer. Um, it actually shares many of the technologies with computer displays. Wind, a 7% uh, experience curve. We track this through our wind turbine price index. Solar, we track through our solar price index. Um, and you can see this is euros per megawatt hour of capacity. So uh, the, the, the rule of thumb for quite a while was you know, that we were shooting for 1 million euros per megawatt for a turbine, and that would be a good price, a good rule of thumb to use. Uh, it actually started back in 1984 at 2, uh, 2, 2 million uh, per megawatt. 7%, it's a lower experience curve because, of course, lots of steel. Uh, you have to build uh, foundations. Uh, it uses a lot of electrical, uh, power electricals, which just don't improve as fast. But here's the interesting thing. We did a lot of work on this uh, in detail last year. And there's something else going on, which is that a 1984 wind farm looked like that and had a 21% capacity factor. And a, 19, a 2011 wind farm looked like that and has a 34% capacity factor. So what's really happening is there's another experience curve um, which is that you get more out of a megawatt of capacity. It's not just that the turbine is cheaper, it's also more efficient. It has lower downtime, it's got better, uh, it's got better power conversion, it's got better control electronics, there's better weather forecasting, etc. Uh, the, the turbines are higher, they're more matched to terrain and to weather conditions. And so you actually have in wind a 14% experience curve. So for every doubling of capacity of the wind industry, you, you have this 14% improvement in cost plus output. And that's very significant because one of the issues in wind is you start to saturate the good places. People say, well, Germany's got a lot of wind. How much more can it do? Well, the answer is if those companies sell their turbines around the world, there's plenty of parts of the world where there isn't that much wind, and then come back when they've doubled uh, uh, experience in 7, 10, 15 years, this will mean that there's a huge repowering opportunity uh, even within those markets that are uh, more saturated. So in other words, the, the price of wind energy will continue to go down. It will never max out. We'll never be at a point where we say, well, we've, that's all we can do with wind. Now we have to look elsewhere. It will continue to get uh, cheaper and cheaper. Um, so th where we are now, already today, is that the best wind farms are competitive with new coal. And they're competitive with gas at about $6 per MMBTU, per million uh, British thermal unit. And um, this is very poorly understood, it has to be said, uh, by, you know, perhaps by people running utilities, but not so much by uh, the, the policymakers, the regulators, and the general public, and the business, uh, the business community, and certainly by voters uh, who are worried that driving for wind pushes up electricity prices. 
because the, the myth is that coal is three cents per kilowatt hour. Well, yes, if you've got an old coal-fired power station that, that, uh, that's fully depreciated and you just shovel coal in the electricity comes out, you may be at three cents. But new coal needs to be scrubbed. You need to pay your interest uh, charges and so on. So you're more like six cents. But you're, at, you're around six cents from the best wind farms today. And by 2016, the average wind farm will be at six cents. And we're talking about a big wind farm that can be built without ridiculous planning constraints and where there's a demand that can use all of the power produced. The gas one is interesting because, of course, in the US at the moment, gas is not at six dollars per million British thermal units, it's at $2. Uh, but all of the, whether it's the forward curve, whether it's the cost base of the gas industry in the US, suggests that that is very much a temporary phenomenon. In fact, I looked yesterday, it was already up to 260. So gas, if it covers its cost, is at about $5 per uh, million BTU, even in the US, using the new shale gas technologies everybody's talking about. And wind is at about six now. So gas is a bit cheaper in the long run, but the wind experience curve ultimately will win that one as well. So that's where we are in terms of these are levelized costs. When you take into account the costs of financing, etc., you can see those down there. For those that can see it, there's a bunch of fossil powered uh, fossil technologies. Um, what's happening, particularly if you add a cost of carbon. Uh, over there, or if you're in Japan or, or Asia where uh, gas is very expensive, what you see now is a whole bunch of clean energy technologies that are fully competitive. These ones here, biomass, gasification, blah, 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 geothermal, wind onshore, that are essentially competitive today. Uh, and that, is, is, that, that really um, is a, that's a fact that is not uh, percolated through um, industry and through the the, the, neither the, I think neither the utility industry nor the supply chain nor the policy uh, nor the broader public. So what this looks like, if I could draw an analogy with the telecoms industry, um, this is a chart that I drew I think in 2010 and I said here's how to think about this stuff is that you've got in telephony you've got a fixed telephone, you've got the, the cost of a fixed <laughs> call and then a mobile call gives you an extra benefit. You've got mobility, you can walk around with it. So you pay a premium and at the time, go back to 1993, when the first mobile phones uh, were in the market, that premium was 10x. So you were paying four and a half cents uh, for a phone call, uh, but if you wanted a mobile call, it would, be, um, it would be 45 cents. And then over 15 years, that premium essentially disappeared. It becomes as cheap to use mobile as landline. And that's how we should think about clean energy versus uh, dirty. And this, this, is what we saw since then. So around 2010, I was just looking at saying, you know, the two lines are converging. They've crossed. This is Germany. This is the feed-in tariff for German solar. And it is now lower than the retail electricity price in Germany. In other words, there is now no need to pay a premium for clean energy uh, in, in Germany um, after a mere six or seven years from the large-scale rollout. Now, this is still a little bit simplistic. There's lots of, you know, there's lots of, um, uh, you know, not everybody is Germany with uh, 23 cents or 24 cent electricity prices, nor do they want to be, and so on. But nevertheless, that model of the premium uh, for clean energy being competed away is very real. And so that, if you start, we'll talk about some of the, the sort of the international relations aspects, but I think it's important to, to have that thesis in mind that, um, this is a complete re-engineering of the world's uh, energy system. It's not, this is not a, uh, a marginal change and a marginal addition. This is a complete re-engineering. It's something that's going to cost trillions, not billions, and it's going to take decades. This is really difficult stuff. It's heavy engineering. It's complex systems. It's actually systems of systems. And while we do it, we don't want the lights to go out. So we've got high risks involved, political risks, uh, economic risks, uh, technical risks. So it will take decades to do this. Um, we also don't want to leave huge amounts of stranded assets which are all in all of our pension portfolios. So we've also got to use what we've got uh, so we're not just taking a wrecking ball to stuff that we've uh, invested money in over time. And it will be funded largely by the capital markets. And the secret there is in those trillions. Governments don't have trillions. Well, probably the Chinese do, but they're the only ones. Um, governments don't have the money to do this. So they can only think about frameworks and make it possible for... Uh, private finance to go in and do the heavy lifting uh, in this transformation. 
But this is stuff I'm confident is happening. This is the way to think about the industry worldwide. Um, the question would be then, how fast will it happen? Will this transformation be a 75-year transformation or will it be a 25-year transformation? And I think that's the sort of range of uh, variables that, that, that we're playing with. I think it's extremely hard to see um, the transformation happening. Um, I don't know what, you'd have to define what the metric of a transformation is, but it's hard to see the scale of change coming to anything near completion within a 10, 15, 20-year time frame. I think we are talking about 25 to 75 years. And so the question is, how fast is it happening? Is it fast enough uh, for, for uh, seen through various different lenses? Um, one of which, of course, is the climate lens. We did this uh, in 2008. We did some work on this was the amount of investment that had uh, gone into clean energy uh, in the past through till 2008. You can see it started at 50 billion and it rose at that point to about 150. And we said that this is the amount of investment that you need mapped onto the sectors that we were tracking. So mapped, again, back to the stuff where I started, I said it's reached 260, so you sort of know the answer to what happened next, which is this. Mapped against that 260 billion, what would we need to see if we're to get emissions from the energy sector worldwide to peak before 2020 and then start to come down? And we said that uh, essentially, you need to get it to 500 billion, half a trillion per year uh, by something like uh, 2015. If we got that level of investment, then you'd be seeing the transition happening at, at, at such a speed that emissions would come down. And these, these are our figures, half a trillion in the things that we track, wind, solar, efficiency, CCS. Um, there are other figures that are bigger because once you start adding in um, transmission, distribution, and nuclear, and the other pieces that are in uh, the assumptions, then the, the numbers are higher. But nevertheless, just mapping like for like, you can see that we're about half of where we need to be, seen through the climate lens. Now, in the, developing, in the developed countries, there's some things that we could do um, uh, to speed that up. Um, one of them is uh, around subsidies. Um, there's the IEA did this tremendous work on fossil fuel subsidies versus clean energy subsidies. Clean energy, 66 billion. Fossil fuels, uh, 409 billion. Actually, a lot of that is in places like Turkmenistan and Iran, so it's not really fair to, to categorize that as a developed world uh, issue. But clearly, if you look at how would you accelerate a transition, if you are subsidizing the thing you want to move away from, that's going to slow it down. There's also some other issues uh, in terms of um, it, it may not be that you can internalize an externality, but you should at least understand it, and maybe there are some things you can do around transparency. Straits of Hormuz gets um, something like, uh, I think it's 17 or 18 percent of all uh, of oil that we're burning as the, in the world goes through that waterway there. There was a piece of work done by um, the Rand Corporation that said that if you didn't have to police the Straits of, uh, of Hormuz, if you didn't have to police the Persian Gulf, this is just for America, then the saving on the Department of Defense budget would be $83 billion uh, per year. And that's a real, they've gone through how you would redeploy forces and what you would therefore be able to save. This isn't just saying the cost of the fifth fleet because you might do something else with it. $83 billion a year uh, is 26 cents for every gallon of gasoline. It's uh, 43 cents for all of the imported gasoline, $15 for every barrel of oil that goes through those straits. And of course, that doesn't appear in people's, uh, when, when they go to the gas station, they don't pay that. They pay for that in their taxes. And so there's, a external, there's another subsidy here that's not really appearing in the right place. Interestingly enough, when I, when I talk to Americans, I always make sure that I, um, that I emphasize this. If you look at where the tankers, uh, whose tankers are being protected, they're not American, right? Because the Americans get their oil mainly from Venezuela and Mexico and the US and Canada. Um, so actually what they're doing is spending $83 billion a year to support the, to protect the supply chain of their strategic uh, economic competitors, China, Korea, uh, and Japan, because that's who's, and, and Europe, that's whose tankers are actually using uh, the Straits of Hormuz. And so, you know, does that seem like a smart investment when you are fiscally challenged in the US nearly as much as we are here in Europe? Um, another one, 
is um, coal and the health costs. There's some work done by Harvard Medi Medical School. You've seen this chart of costs. The one at the bottom is coal-fired uh, uh, power, which is the cheapest as long as you don't have any cost of carbon, um, and particularly with old <coughs> power stations. But here's the subsidy from health, and that is particulates, <coughs> asthma, it's mercury, it's uh, additional road accidents, and it's accidents in the mining industry. This is just for the US. doesn't count the 2,000 miners per year killed uh, uh, mining coal in China. Um, but of course, we all benefit from cheap Chinese goods using energy uh, that results. But if you just add in the US the costs of the externality costs there, you essentially render coal completely uh, uncompetitive. And almost every technology other than marine you know, uh, tidal and, and wave already vastly more attractive than coal. Interestingly, in the US, this year, coal use will be down 14% on last year. So the message is getting through, and coal is essentially, it's going to be impossible, it's essentially already impossible to build a new coal-fired power station uh, in the US, uh, and coal use going off a cliff. Of course, what they're looking at is exporting that coal to Asia, where the demand has not dropped off. Um, but now let's come to how would you accelerate it. So those are some things that, are, uh, that, that would give impetus if we could resolve in the developed world. Um, but then there's also the international discussions, and particularly if you look at this um, chart here, of all of that investment in 2011 in clean energy, you can see OECD took 54%. Basic, so that's, it used to be BRIC, but Russia's not doing anything and South Africa is, so now it becomes basic. They're doing 41% and rest of the world 5%. And that is um, a large part of Latin America. It's all of Africa other than South Africa, and it's a large part of Southeast Asia. And it's important countries here that are neither OECD nor BASIC um, that could be potentially very big drivers of energy demand. Uh, we've all seen those figures from IEA and so on, 40% uh, more demand or whatever by 2050. Malaysia, Indonesia, Egypt, Iran, uh, very populous countries that are getting almost no investment, and plus a whole host of smaller countries. And so then the question is, well, surely we ought to all push for uh, an agreement uh, in the international climate negotiations, because that's the way to funnel more money to those countries. Um, and there's Rio 1992, and just so we recap, that was Kyoto 1997, uh, and then the negotiations, these are all the COP discussions from Kyoto, Buenos Aires, The Hague, Marrakesh, New Delhi. You can't keep up with it. There's one every year. They ended up in Copenhagen, famously in 2009. Since then, they've been to uh, Cancun. Uh, they've been to Durban. Wonderful place to visit, by the way. Uh, and then this year, it's going to be in Qatar. Now, the point I'm making here is this has not been effective. This is now... Qatar will be COP18. And so I... I have personally decided I'm not going to go to Qatar, I didn't go to Cancun, I didn't go to Durban, because I can't see how that process is going to lead to success. But I've actually gone further than that. I now think that that process is actually harmful. Because what happens is once a year, everybody gets together to fail publicly, very, uh, with a very high profile. And, um, and to me, when I see the alternatives which is the sorts of processes, the sorts of investments that I've been talking about, then it seems to me this is an unproductive and unhelpful way um, to, be, to be carrying on self. Um, the alternative is these are national climate-related policies. So these are uh, energy efficiency, renewable <coughs> energy, and climate change or carbon-specific policies um, over the past 13 years 1,811 policies. This is at the national level. But there's also stuff going on at municipal level. There's the C40 cities. There's stuff that Mayor Bloomberg, my, my owner, uh, uh, is doing in, in uh, driving forwards, not just in New York, but also uh, in the broader... Um, uh, I think the C40 cities is now 56 cities. Um, but then even down to uh, at industry level, bilateral level, there's US-China energy cooperation, there's actually China-Netherlands, there's Indonesia-Netherlands, there's all sorts of bilaterals, and there's also uh, in different sectors, so steel industry and cement industry, um, uh, the, the, big, the big retailers, uh, there's a number of forums for the utility industry, and so there are agreements and initiatives at every level 
um, that are serving to drive the investment flow that we've seen. So on the one hand, you have the UNFCCC process, which essentially now is saying that we all agree that in 2015, we will negotiate an agreement which will come into force in 2020, which may not be ambitious enough to be of any use, and it may not be ratified by key players, and if ratified, as we've seen from Canada, it may not be implemented. And I just don't want to put many eggs in that basket versus a process which has already resulted in a trillion dollars, which has already got us half of the way to where we need to be. Wouldn't it be more sensible to think about how we could accelerate initiatives that are already working uh, and see if we couldn't just um, double the, the, the work rate within those processes and processes like them? Um, and there is stuff going on on that front. So I'm uh, involved, final slide, in this thing called Sustainable Energy for All, um, which is an umbrella, uh, also under the auspices of the UN, UN Secretary General. I'm on the high-level group, along with a, a bunch of extremely um, uh, worthy... Uh, the, U the US Secretary of Energy is on there, and the CEO of Statoil, and, and a number of, uh, of other business leaders, and, uh, and also policy leaders. Um, and... It's not about trying to negotiate and nobody does anything until the negotiations are completed. It's about accelerating uh, initiatives, sharing best practices, and pushing uh, the sector forwards, raising awareness as well uh, through the good offices of the Secretary General. There are plenty of others. There's the Clean Energy Ministerial, if you like international multilateral activities. Of course, there's all, the act all of the programs of the various uh, multilateral banks. Um, whether it's multilaterals, World Bank, IFC, and so on, or whether it's uh, KFW in Germany or, uh, or, or JBIC in Japan and so on. So there's plenty of um, initiatives uh, out there that are also international, not purely domestic, um, that are resulting in investment and moving the needle in our energy mix. And those are the ones that I tend to uh, prefer supporting because I see them as being um, very effective. So I... I think we have, that's my prepared um, remarks, but I understand we have um, time and desire for perhaps some questions. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.